Oh. Hey, good morning, and welcome to the Comedy Experience uh, Graphic Novel Month Club, the kids' version for the month of October. Uh, our our book is a really cool book here. It's Witch for Hire by Ted Nafee, who's sitting right here next to me. Hey, Ted. Hey, how's it going? Good. How are you, brother? I can't complain. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, under the circumstances, yeah. we're all just getting by. Yeah. Yeah, you know, surviving this this uh, hellscape. Yeah, I, I Ted's here in San Francisco, so it's easy to you know have you come over and, and not feel like you know. I live right around the corner. Yeah. Like, oh, really? Like yeah. right around the corner? I live I live on uh, up the street, like five six blocks. Oh up wow. Up. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I just never come into comic book stores these days. Yeah. I, you know, I'm too busy making them. Yeah. You yeah. got to have time to read them. Yeah. Which really sucks. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, so, so that's the first, it's always the first question. You just gave me a really good reason to ask the first question. Mm -hmm. Um, why comics, right? Of all the things you could be doing in the whole wide world, you obviously, you have a lot of talent, you know, um, and comics are not exactly the pathway to money and fame, you know, uh, the, the, uh, that wasn't the point. Yeah. You know, I, I love that I can, with comics, you can just think up an idea and do it. Yeah. You don't have to run it by you know, a committee, you don't have to test to see if uh, there's a market for it. You can just, you know, and, and what I notice is that the bigger the media, the further behind they are when it comes to like making a statement, doing something new and fresh, right? Like everything has to be tested and, mm -hmm. and marketed. And is there an audience for this? And mm -hmm. you know, who's starring in it and blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. With comics, you just like, I wanna do this cockamamie idea that nobody believes in, but I'm just gonna make it happen. And you'll see what I was getting at once you see the finished product. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and like you can do that in comics because it's so it's cheap. It's yeah. not effortless. Yeah. It's all the it's, it's all the work <laughs> is in the work. Not yeah, yeah. necessarily there's no money that goes right. into it. It's right. It's just pen and paper. Yeah. And a photocopier. Yeah. And and then it's you know, there it is. You can see it, you can hold it in your hands after that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I love the, the the simplicity of just being able to think it up, put it down. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. When did you when did you first know you wanted to start making comics? Um, well, I was you know I was a young teenager and I was reading uh, Mage by yeah. Matt Wagner yeah. in nineteen eighty <laughs> and um, four five yeah, something yeah, like yeah, that yeah yeah nineteen eighty five yeah and um, and it seemed possible yeah you know it was like he was doing something really fresh he was it felt his work his writing felt so um like he was really getting something real while at the same time it felt accessible like this is it was it, it was just so comfortable the way yeah. he wrote like he's just thinking it up and putting it down yeah and then drawing it and his drawings were really gorgeous and yeah. of course he had sam keith inking yeah. at the time um who went on to do the max right and uh you know this little thing called sandman yep yeah uh <laughs> but no, uh, he doesn't he doesn't like any of his work on that book which on, is on on sandman on sandman he oh yeah, like yeah any of his work on it well he, i i'm friends with mike dringenberg who's yeah. uh you know who was the inker on it yeah. in the original run yeah. and then he took over pencils yeah and he was a much better fit for pencils he yeah. really established the the look and feel sure. of the book that sure. really set the stage and sure Sam just never felt like, according to Mike, Sam never felt like he was the right fit for yeah, the book. Yeah. Uh, and I think Neil wanted to do wanted um, Tom Yates mm. on it initially, but Tom wasn't available, and so he, you know, he's like, and I, they said I, Sam I, Keith, and he said yes. I thought Sam, Sam was great. quite good actually on, right. on those first issues, and well, that's that's neither here. You wonder where you know. I'm, now we're talking like fans <laughs> and not like well, I'm a creator. <laughs> anyway, yes, it was Matt Wagner. Yeah. Sorry, ADD brain. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's all good. It's all keep good. Me on, keep me on track. Yeah. Help me out here. No, no, no. I like I like this kind of conversation. This because it's a conversation, right? Right. You know. Right. Um. Uh. So 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 Sam or so Mage was your was your first hit. M Mage was my first like love love. Yeah. And you know I had read uh, um, Camelot three thousand mm -hmm. Brian Bullen's mm -hmm. gorgeous artwork, mm -hmm. but Brian's work was so inaccessible. Mm -hmm you know professional right and matt was you know still he was a kid he was like 22 23 when he was drawing that yeah, yeah, yeah. and it felt like oh i could 
almost do this. Yeah. Well, and if you look even at his first couple of issues, right? Like he's he's not very good. In oh that, yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. Because I sorry, I, you well, can I, see that there's something there, right? But he's he's just he's not what he becomes in like four issues later. Well, yeah. I came in around issue eight. Yeah. And then I went backward and I realized, oh, he couldn't really draw hair yeah. earlier yeah. on. So everybody had black hair. Yeah. And then little by little, he like, you know, I think uh, Mirth, the mage, yeah. uh, came, like he changed his hair to white yeah. at some point. Yeah. And uh, uh, for various reasons yeah. that were in story and that yeah. made sense. And other, you know, other things like that. And I'm like, oh, he was so young and so inexperienced that he couldn't even draw hair. Yeah. So just everybody's hair was a solid black silhouette. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it was it was that crude and yet there was so much character in it. Yeah. There was so much individuality. Yeah. And so you thought you could do it. And so I it felt, you know, it felt accessible in a way that Brian Bullen's work was not accessible. Yeah. And then somebody handed me the Dark Knight Returns, and that was electrifying because yeah. I had left Batman yeah. behind in, you know, on a TV show where right. I grew out of right. you know, a kid's TV show. Yeah. And suddenly Batman was like and you know, of course, that little electrical excitement of seeing clearly a goofy little kid's idea turned into an adult idea yeah. that's still a, just knocking people's socks off here it is what 40 years later yeah yeah um dark knight returns was 86 something like that yeah, yeah. and yeah. that was like i mean they were doing that of course they started doing that in the 70s when, sure sure when neil adams was sure to take over but but never quite like Dark Knight and Dark Knight was not just like, that, but the presentation of it, it the, yeah. the, the prestige. Format. Yeah, 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 very elegant. Yeah. I've always yeah. loved the comic book size, but mm -hmm. with a little spine. Yeah. I feel like that's the most elegant way of yeah. delivering comic books. Yeah. Anyway, did you um, did, you're in high school at? I was in or, early. I was a high school freshman when I okay. discovered this stuff. Okay. Yeah. And the, and so I walked into a comic book store. It was yeah. called Best of Two Worlds. It was up on Hate Street. Mm. And this young man named yeah. Brian Hibbs. Hi. I walk up to him and I said, what else? So I've been reading this and it's knocking my socks off. What else you got? And you gave me three issues of Swamp Thing. Yeah. Um, so and it was it's, right, it's an easy handoff. <laughs> it was right in the middle of like Crisis of Two Earths. Yeah. And I, so you gave me like three issues yeah. spread out. Yeah. Um, but like one of them was like this standalone where the swamp thing like drops a tuber off of his body uh -huh. and people uh some people find this guy finds it and takes it home and finds it has some hallucinogenic properties yeah. and you know and gives it to some friends and like one has a really bad trip on uh -huh. it and ha basically goes through um a uh you know like a psychedelic experience sure. where he re-experiences the swamp things early issues right um, and then the other one, ha he becomes a swamp thing in his, it, you know, it's the point of view is of the monster. Yeah. Of the mon from the right. point of view of the monster, he becomes the swamp thing right. in, in the, in his trip and has a really <laughs> rough time. Mm -hmm. And then the other one, who's a guy who's like looking for something for his wife to, cause she was dying of cancer Yeah, and they have the most beautiful, right. heartbreaking right. moment of like acceptance of death. Yeah. And like, and of course, at the time, Alan Moore was even like maybe mid twenties when right. he was writing this stuff, and right. and I was like, that wow, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. what comics can do, mm -hmm. unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so that gave me like, I, I want to get in on this. Yeah. You know, this feels like, again, I can just do this by myself. Yeah, I don't have to ask anyone's permission. Yeah, I don't have to be good enough. I can just do it, yeah. and nobody, you know, nobody cares if I'm good enough or not. It just can happen. Yeah, and it's still, still to this day, I love that comics are just a thing that you can just sit down and start drawing. And at the end of it, you have pictures with word balloons that tell a story. Yeah, yeah, you know, and that's there's yeah. nothing like it. I love it. I love it. Um, let's. Uh, I I want to I want to talk about the past, but let's talk about the book because. Jordan's always on me to not talk about the book early enough because the kids like right. About let's the book. talk about which perhaps. <gasps> so sure. where did where did the idea for this come from? Oh boy, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I had been doing a, a another like magical little girl story for mm -hmm. a long time called Courtney Crummer. Yep, and I really loved it, but I started to think about the concept of witches because mm -hmm. I was toying with it with Courtney Crummer, and, uh, and I realized that like what was Courtney Crummer was missing was the witch hat and the iconic right. kind of, there's something about witches that I, I thought 
was really important to explore the idea of women with power mm. who want to make the world better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, what, what does the world say to them? Burn the witch. Mm. And mm -hmm, that's what mm -hmm. I really wanted to do. Like I wanted to do, it hit me that I wanted to do a story with a girl who wears a witch hat mm -hmm. like a kid going to high school wearing a mohawk. Right. You know, this is, you know, this is my truth to power. This is my, you know, symbol of, you know, separation and otherness. And it's also my um, declaration, my creed that I, I believe in, you know, having power and using it yeah. to help people. Yeah. Um, and uh, whether, you know, and also, but helping people while speaking truth to power at the same time, while, while um, believing in this story is really about, I'm going to believe you when everybody else is telling you you're crazy. Yeah. When, every, the, when the whole world is gaslighting you and telling yeah. you you're crazy to, that this is not happening to you. Yeah. I believe you. I believe your story. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, and that's that's kind of was the, just the kind of idea, the kid that wears the witch. And the other thing was witch for hire. The, the title kind of came into my mind and I thought, you know, the girl in the, you know, has her little office with her little desk. And right, at some point, right. the story's going to get this. Right. He's got a little office with a little desk, you know, behind a little desk. And the witch's hat is hanging on a hat rack by the door like Sam Spade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that really tickled me. And like, uh -huh. you know, people are like, full grown adults are walking in. And, and she's like, and the cat's sitting on the desk. And, and she's like, <laughs> Sit down. What's your problem? <laughs> I like that. I like that. So, so you see, uh, there being more books. Oh, I have plans. Yeah. Like I'm really. I mean, if this book takes off, uh -huh. you know, and it's you know, it's touch and go right now. We'll see what happens. You never know until the first few quarters are over. Sure. Um, but if if I you know if it goes on, oh boy, yeah. There's yeah. like, I have big plans. Like yeah. the other thing I want to do with it. Is bring in other iconic witches from pop media, like nice. like the next story is going to have a kind of a you know Wicked Witch of the West type mm -hmm, character mm -hmm. named Black Annis, mm -hmm. um, who is going to be the worst witch there ever was, but she's obviously you know that also means that she's the best witch that ever was, right? Right. Um, and I and then later on, I think I think I want to introduce a Baba Yaga character because that that mm -hmm. really I like the idea that. Baba Yaga was originally uh, sort of a earthy, you know, wild mother figure huh, okay. in ancient pre-Christian Russian mm -hmm. folklore. And then when Christianity came along, she got vilified into this bo boogeyman type yeah. character. But she didn't change. Yeah. The attitudes changed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what was it about her, you know, riding around, this terrifying character, riding around literally in a medicine create you know like she rides in a mortar yeah. with a pestle yeah, yeah. right yeah and um and which is never, what you use to make that way. medicine yeah it's, that's funny i've never thought about that that's really obvious and you, yet i hadn't thought about that and yeah. and then another one and so i want to have uh, um faye faulkner the main character mm -hmm. meet all of these vilified witch icons mm -hmm. and discover that no it's not them that's bad it's the world it's the same with like think about elizabeth bathory Here's mm -hmm. a woman who was a widow mm -hmm. uh, who had all this power in this region. And all of a sudden, all these stealing virgins and taking them into her castle and drinking, splitting them open and drinking their blood. And, yeah. uh, and she got, and they, they came to the castle. And this is a true story. They came to this castle and they, they locked her up in her own castle mm. and she died there. Mm. Now, what's more likely that she was really this crazy serial killer, like right. stealing you know, stealing young women and bathing in their blood. Yeah. Or that, you know, this story, this rumor was spread around until she got vilified enough that people who wanted what she had could just waltz into her castle and take over and the townspeople would go, yes, that's a good idea. Yeah. Like, so I want to do so, something sure. like that. Too. Sure, sure, sure. Wow, so it sounds like you've, you've got ideas for... I got ideas four. for days for, for, uh, for Faye Faulkner, yeah. Nice, nice. Yeah. Oh, also, yeah, the character's name is Faith Faulkner because I wanted to, I wanted to get another little shout out to a noir mm. uh, kind of vibe, you know, that yeah. she's like a, you know, and at the end of this book, she gets a little business card that says Witch for Hire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it, was, it was a great little moment. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> the, 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 a lot of the book is about bullying. Yeah. 
Um, and it's it's a little hard to read in places. It's rough, yeah. It's a, you know, rough is what, you know, like life, like pe- the world is rough. And, you know, it's, I think Terry Pratchett used to say um, the point, or maybe it was actually, it's actually, what's the name of Chesterton, actually. I think he's mm. somebody, one of these people, you know, fantasy uh, isn't trying to tell children that dragons are real. Every child knows that dragons are real. Right. Fantasy is trying to tell you that dragons can be defeated. Yeah. Right. So, like, I feel like that's kind of the purpose of fan- It's the fantasy is finding in the world the secret magic that you can use to defeat the monsters. Mm-hmm. And, like, the bullies are real monsters in the mm-hmm. world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know? Were you were you at all worried about dealing with such rough uh, material to begin with? I wasn't. My yeah. publishers were. Yeah, you know, like there was uh, there was some editing that okay. got that got ha- that happened where they're like, yeah, you know, you're using some real life stuff here, and you we really can't have you doing mm-hmm. that. And I'm like, okay, right. And I was like, I don't know. I'm gonna push back a little bit, and then I had a friend of mine who's a teacher of uh, special needs kids and she said yeah, you can't do that. Mm. and uh there was um because i had originally used this uh, uh internet hoax called momo the momo challenge mm-hmm. which wasn't a real thing but the terror of it spread through the you know the parents community there were everybody parents were terrified of this whole thing um and so i had literally lifted that the way people lifted the the um slender man Mm-hmm. And put that as like it's it's a you know one of these challenges mm-hmm. things, and my editor is brilliant. Uh, she was like, you know, you know, we're getting some pushback about this. How do you feel about changing it to a different name? I'm like, oh, let me think of another name. And uh, I, uh, my friend Lan Pitts suggested Tengu, which mm-hmm. is a Japanese you know demon character. Mm-hmm. And so I changed it to that. And then another person at the staff said, yeah, you know, but that's kind of, you're you're appropriating a cultural myth from Japan. Right. And you're not doing anything with Japanese culture. Right. So that's, you can't really do that either. Right. right, That doesn't feel right. So my editor pointed out, um, Charlotte, she pointed out that, uh, you know, the thing about the whole challenge internet challenges thing is it's kind of over nobody's mm-hmm. really doing that anymore right what is going on is influencers mm-hmm. and toxic influencers mm-hmm. kind of promoting self-aggrandizement as though it's self-care mm-hmm. uh and i thought that that would you know and and kind of narcissism as though it's self-care mm-hmm. and i thought that's that's a real that's heavy yeah, because that's kind of what uh, the big thing that's going on in culture, uh, and I thought that would be worth really addressing. Like, what if like the idea of passing narcissism as self care mm. was a curse mm-hmm, that mm-hmm, was mm-hmm. being spread as though it's a self blessing? Like, if you go and you jump in on this, yeah. and you know, and you're like, this is what's going to make me strong, and, and then you've suddenly made yourself vulnerable to a curse, and, yeah. like, and you now you're on a track, and you have to keep doing it or else bad things will happen to yeah. you and and but it turns out the bad things are not coming from this magical place the bad things are just coming from everybody else right it. so i thought that would be a really interesting premise for a story and that's so that's kind of the source of my curse creature yeah. where, where where she came from mm-hmm. love it yeah love it yeah um it, you have gotten some a little bit of blowback on on the book i mean you know goodreads uh, was the first wave of reviews and right. the, uh, the Goodreads people, there's a lot of, um, uh, there's a, there's a, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on like writing, you know, addressing current issues in the correct way. Mm. And, you know, there's, you know, I'm just not on the wavelength enough to always have the right way to do it. And so maybe right. I, you know, maybe I kind of, ran roughshod over some of these very delicate issues yeah. and I'll take my lumps if I did it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like that's kind of, that's all we can do. Yeah. Right. You know, we, we do our best. We say our, uh, you know, we, we, we say what we're trying to say. Mm-hmm. And, uh, we, if we, if we do it well, great. And everybody pats us on the back. If we 
you know, if we kind of step on toes and kind of cross boundaries, then it becomes a subject of discussion. Yeah. And I don't, I don't want to silence that discussion. Sure. I want to join into that and say, oh, how can I be better? Sure, sure, sure. Sure. You know, it makes how, a lot of sense. And, you know, the, the last Courtney book, like, also got a Goodreads mm -hmm. review. And, um, and they, they applauded me for addressing certain issues about, you know, gender queerness and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But they pointed out not a lot of people of color in this book. Right. You know, and I'm like, eh, you know, that's, that's true. Everybody, everybody reads is basically white and mm -hmm. like, you know, I can do better than that. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's lazy. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and it's, it's kind of, you know, like the, the, I feel like the public at large, the, you know, woke, if you will, culture is basically kind of calling out that, you know, here's a, here are the cliches mm -hmm. that everybody's doing maybe you need to branch out sure and i feel like that's a that's that's a message that i should always be listening yeah. to yeah no and i and i think i think you, we can see in comics that that most people are you know yeah oh it's wonderful it's amazing, amazing. And, 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 yeah and and it, it gets you a, a much wider range of things too so mm -hmm. yeah well i mean with, as far as queerness goes you know my uh you know i was writing a, i was writing a pitch with a friend and i'm like and we were, you know, we were bouncing around ideas. I'm like, what if this character, uh, what if these two, you know, the boy and the girl don't get together because the girl is a lesbian. She has a crush on, mm -hmm. on her, you know, this other character. And my friend was like, oh, they won't let us get away with that. I'm mm -hmm. like, but, uh, you know, she had just automatically went to self-censorship because right. she'd heard that so many times. Right. Back when I was, you know, younger, this is what I wanted to do in, mm -hmm. in my books. And I did a book called How Loathsome that was mm -hmm. all about San Francisco queer culture. Mm -hmm. And um they uh and you know the publishers were very no, you know, we can't, there's no market for that. And the world has changed. Mm -hmm. And it is just like what a relief. Oh my God, I get to write the stories I've been wanting to write so much. Yeah. And every, all the other creators, all the younger creators have Blown past me, they're like, "Oh, we've got this." Yeah, Head, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice try. We I, got this. I don't know about anybody else, but we sold plenty of copies of of Hello Oh, yeah. fantastic! Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, I yeah. mean, San Francisco sold it. I ran into a copy in Sydney. That yeah. was nice. Yeah. Um, you know, I you know I've seen it around. It did yeah. okay. It did yeah. okay. I, it did great for us at the time. It, right. Local boys. You mm -hmm. know. So. Right. Yeah. The local. Yeah. The local boys. Yeah. yeah. Me and Tristan. Yeah. 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 And and the same thing with you and Serena, you know. Uh, yeah, that was the goth book. Yeah, yeah, right. That was a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. One of these days, we're gonna we gotta bring a uh, gloom cookie out of gloom mothballs, cookie, yeah, yeah. do a re-release, and then finally do like the a couple of short stories we all always talked about doing that yeah. we never got around to. And, yeah. You know, when Serena and I, you know, we just were so both so busy, and like she's like, okay, let's do this, and I'm like, right, I'm gonna write up my bio, and then I lose track mm -hmm. <laughs> you know add brain right you know you don't have a file with the bio in it that you can just <laughs> you know it needs to be updated Every, you know because you know you write it and then two yeah. years later you yeah. like it's like that's yeah. not my latest stuff anymore. no that's that's true that's, that, is, that is a fair point that's mm -hmm. a fair point I, I run into that myself yeah um uh so so how did you get started doing the comics originally what was um well, I mean, the first thing you do, that, this is the other thing we were talking about, like, you just think it up and do it. So I just drew some Batman pages. Yeah. You know, a little wordless story. Right. And uh, took them to a comics convention, and this was in 1990. Mm -hmm. And they were desperate for just people who knew which way the pencil worked, mm -hmm. you know? And so, I, you know, my little scribbles became job opportunities. Yeah. And I was thrown into the deep end and found that I couldn't swim, but yeah. I scribbled struggled and floundered and you know uh was putting out a book every three months because it was just oh well, this is exhausting work yeah you know you have to do you know i can do five pages in a month yeah but 24 pages in a month is uh, kind of a tall order yeah um page day that's the right that's and the, to somebody else's script too i yep. you know like you mean i have to put multiple characters in every panel? right that's crazy yeah. how do you live at that speed yeah and um and so it was, yeah, it was uh, hard to wrap my head around. Which, what, what, which comics are these? I don't remember this. The first book I did was through Innovation, and they had... Ooh, Innovation, okay. Mm -hmm. They had, uh, had a huge success doing the Vampire of the Stock comic. Right. 
Um, and that, because it was just gorgeously yeah, painted. It was beautiful. And uh, and they were like, well, we'll do more of this. So they got The Color of Magic, and then mm. they got uh, Gene Wolfe's Shadow of the Torturer. And mm. they hired me to mm. draw that, and I did mm. three issues. Totally failed. Of course, by that, by, by today's standards, that, those books would have been a resounding success. Sure, but sure, like, sure. Back in the day, under three thousand copies yeah. an issue was a failure. Yeah. Um, so it just didn't, you know. Yeah. And uh, and so they canceled that for three issues. Also, I was really struggling, but I did get a Russ Manning Award yeah. nomination for best newcomer. You know, they whatever I was doing, the you know the powers that be over at Comic Con liked it. That's got to be nice on the. On oh, the first so, oh my God! Well, you know how it is when you're young and dumb. You think. Oh yes, I signed. I showed up, and here's my reward. <laughs> you know, and then you realize later, like it's the same thing with Courtney. Yeah, I did my first book mm -hmm. that I wrote and drew. Mm -hmm. First thing out of the gate, huge mm -hmm. success mm -hmm. by independent comic yep. standards. So the next one will be even bigger. Yeah, you know, nothing touched the popularity of Courtney. Sure, nothing got quite that close. Sure, you know, every. Everything was just not quite there, and uh, because I think Courtney just hit all the right buttons. Yeah, and and um, you know, and you don't really when you're young and you have those initial successes, you don't really realize until you until hindsight that you know those successes were were lucky. You were lucky to have mm. them, and uh, even little ones like oh, nominated for the Russ Manning Best Newcomer Award, mm -hmm. like that. You know, that's pretty damn sweet. Yeah. Um, and the Courtney success, you know, like really catching the goom cookie success, really catching a wave right out of the gate. Yeah. Um, those, you know, like those successes, I've never attained anything like that since with anything else other than Courtney and goom cookie. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, I'll always be, now I'm deeply grateful mm. that, that I had those, you know, that Courtney is still beloved. Mm -hmm. uh, and that mm -hmm. something, whatever the hell it was that I did, you know, tapped into something. Like, mm -hmm. Courtney is like the easiest book I've ever written. Like, mm -hmm. it just, the ideas just come. Everything else I'm just, you know, struggling with and like trying to find the right formula. And, right. Like, trying to think it through. And Courtney is just like, it, it was all gut instinct. And, you know, it turns out that's the best thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, uh, it's interesting because there's, there's any number of creators who have kind of a similar story where they've, come up with something yeah i was mm -hmm. talking to terry moore for example oh right you know, a huge yeah. hit with strangers in paradise and yeah. everything after that really has never not mm -hmm. done well it, the work hasn't changed his 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 skill and craft is, has, is only gotten better right uh there's nothing wrong with the ideas just some ideas get popular and some ideas don't and right. i i don't know what it is i even mm -hmm. as a guy who sells them, I, I can't figure it out. It's, there's just no, it's luck. Yeah. You know, it's just the luck that you catch the zeitgeist, you know, and like, you know, Strangers in Paradise caught, caught the zeitgeist, Courtney caught the zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, what I realized was that I was like, you know, every time I run into San Sakai every once in a while at, at, um, at Comic Con, and he's such a terrifically nice man. He is. Yeah. And, um, and I look at this guy who's been doing this Ronin Rabbit yeah. for, 35 years yeah. since I was a kid. I mean, yeah. this is be before I even picked up Swamp Thing. My buddy had was picking up the, you know, the anthropomorphic comics. Yeah. And back in the in in the 80s, there was that that little trend where right. the, you know, the Albedo books came mm -hmm. out, and the mm -hmm. the, you know, mm -hmm. um, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles right. and Usagi Yojimbo. Yeah. Um and uh so I I, you know, and like, and so I remember the early Usagi Yojimbo comics, and he was a very different style, much cleaner and simpler, more precise. And then he just started getting looser and looser, and like it became more Americanized, I guess. Yeah. But it's just so, like, he really, I love the way his work evolved. I yeah. love that. Um, I love that he just stuck with it. But it hit me that here's this guy who's been doing the same book for 35 years, and he's only been, gotten more legendary. And the other day, I was playing a video game called. Ghost of Tsushima. Mm -hmm. Guess what the name, main character's name is? Usagi? Sakai. Oh, Sakai. Okay. The, and it's very. And they said that they based this book or this game and uh -huh. the the culture, uh -huh. or the, the the adventure texture of the game, on. And the game is set in 12th century Japan or 13th century Japan during the Mongolian invasion. Yeah. 
but the feel of it wandering through the countryside and run you know and having these adventures was based on usagi yojimbo yeah, yeah uh and i just love that he you know after all these years of just patiently and you know lovingly you know pushing the rock up the hill mm -hmm. with this book um it's like it became a classic yeah. you know like just slowly and surely and i'm like why did i abandon courtney after seven volumes like right every time i got back to it my publisher it, like when i went after book four my and i wanted to go off and do other things and my publisher said you should do another like the 10 year anniversary is coming up you should do more yeah and so i did the last two volumes and um and I ended up with a big finisher, a wrap-up story with these, you know, the last two volumes, and and I realized I had done something really special. Like, yeah, but it's done now. Yeah. I'm going to go off and do other things. Right. And then they said, "Why don't you do it again?" And every time they say that, like, I don't know if I have more Courtney stories with me. I put pen to paper and mm -hmm. off they go. You know, mm -hmm. it's the same thing with the uh, with the the re most recent the the series sequel, which is called the Crumber and Chronicles. Yeah. Um. I just put pen to paper and this idea just flowed out. Yeah. And, um, you know, I just like, I've learned to just have, um, uh, humility before the, you know, the magic of that idea that just came that people liked. Yeah. I didn't have to, you know, I didn't feel like I earned it, but yeah. you know, it's not about that. You don't earn that success. You, you're lucky enough to get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Does it, does it make you more reticent to to try to do new stories like this, or does it make you burn that much harder to try? No, you know, I, I at this point I've come to a piece about like just having having uh, reverence for the magic of having done something that people yeah people really resonate with, yeah. and you know I'm I'm always going to have new ideas and different ideas, yeah. you know I have like. You know, I want to do a thing, a science fiction thing about, you know, about a, you know, a, you know, like Earth kind of setting up, or, you know, the Earth escaping Earth and setting up a colony in space and finding giant robots on the planet and blah, yeah. blah, blah. And, um, and I want to do that, but, you know, that has nothing to do with, with the Courtney world and it's completely different. Um, but, you know, I also want to just acknowledge that, like, I, you know, I was lucky enough to have a success with Courtney yeah. and I might as well keep going with that as well. Yeah. And which for hire, if it takes off, I'm going to do a ton more of those. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and is there an, another Kremlin Chronicles? Um, I have plans for like endless. I'm working on the huh. second one now okay. and I have plans for probably a dozen more. Yeah. Nice. Um, because it's just, you know, like what I, what, what people pointed out is that it, you know, over the course of writing the story about this little girl, I had created this little, this world that has this tremendous potential and it like it mm -hmm. just grew and grew and grew mm -hmm. and and put down roots and built uh you know built into the past of you know the world and you know has all this potential going forward and 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 every time i thought about it it got bigger yeah so the book i'm doing now with with the Kremlin chronicles is um this idea that Courtney and the mess that she left in in her wake has drawn the attention of um, Homeland Security. Huh. Okay. <laughs> and so there's this small division of Homeland Security is just going like this is like a this is a clear and present danger. Yeah. And uh, who is this person? And uh -huh. Like this is very mysterious, and you won't believe me. And but we're, you know, blah blah blah. Yeah. Like, Love it. That's yeah. great. That's great. So like basically the X Files is going after her. Yeah. That's great. That's great. So you could eventually get to a science fiction story out of that. Eventually, yeah. You know, I mean, eventually I'll do something. But, crumb you know, runs in space, you know. Crumb runs in space. <laughs> I don't like to cross the streams that much. You know, I, it's a little tricky and like, yeah, yeah, no. I mean, it is, man, the way that they do it with the, with when back in the 60s when they, when they combined like, you know, Tony Stark sci-fi with, you know, Thor fan and, and uh -huh. you know, Hulk sci-fi with uh -huh. Thor fantasy and, uh -huh. You know, and like the Fantastic Four sci-fi with the fantasy of Thor. Yeah. And they just managed to marry them. With yeah. they, and they marry them because they were just, just too stupid to realize that it wasn't going to work. And yeah. they made it work, you yeah. know. Yeah. And, uh, but I, man, they thread the needle. Uh -huh. Like, and sometimes it just, no, this makes no sense. Yeah. 
So I kind of like to really be careful about keeping those streams separate. And if I am going to combine them, I really want to do it with a yeah. great deal of intention. That's cool. So let's um, let's talk maybe about uh, about which for hire. Uh, no, no, no. About <laughs> about pitching the book. Like, how do you how do you pitch a new idea like this? Especially you know, since you've you've got many things in your in your past, right? You know. Well, I mean, you know, like I have a pedigree because of. Um, the Courtney Cameron series, yep. so I could, you know, I could prove like I I can actually do this. I can mm -hmm. actually finish a book, mm -hmm. which is, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, everybody wants to do a graphic novel, but it, until you finished a graphic novel, you yeah. just don't realize yeah. it's a lot of work. What you know, yeah. you know, and it's all on you. Mm -hmm. Nobody's there to stand there, you know, over your shoulder mm -hmm. and go get it done. Mm -hmm. That's the the only person that's doing that is you. Mm -hmm. And for somebody like me, who's just you know like, you know, has terrible attention span and focus um the process of getting it done is like learning to like fall in love with the idea of getting to the end yeah um was a long process uh but i managed to make it i managed to make it uh but uh, and but i what i did to pitch it uh is the trick is really just coming up with an idea that you can you know the old elevator pitch idea but that's just a process of just blathering out you know, as close as you can, getting everything in, and then sitting down and going, okay, I've just written the pitch for this story. It's 20 pages long. Yeah. Now I need to write it in 10 pages. Now I need to write it in four pages. Now I need to write it in two pages. Mm. And it has to be the whole story. Mm -hmm. But just simplify, pages. simplify, simplify. Yeah. Like yeah. what is unessential? Yeah. yeah. You know, what doesn't need to be expressed in the pitch? Isn't, isn't that also the art of comics? It is ultimately, yeah, is, is yeah. stripping things out and it's getting to getting one in, perfect yeah. image and another perfect image. Yeah, getting from a, like a you know like a just endless notes to that the simple haiku mm -hmm. of it. The story is this, mm -hmm. dun, 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 mm -hmm. and that tells you everything you need to know. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing how in the process of going from the twenty-page blather to the two-page precise thing, mm -hmm. you find these ways of sharpening your your story beats instead mm -hmm. of like and this kind of happens and that kind of happens and then this kind of happens and that leads to this result it's like this happens and it this one thing happens and it just changes everything mm -hmm. um and you find like more elegant and precise and simple ways to and i find the more you simplify the harder the impact is mm -hmm. oftentimes mm -hmm. like sometimes um just the you know the simpler answers and i did this with um which was with which for hire too where you know this like once i boil it down like these simple turns mm -hmm. that changed everything mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um uh made you know made the story i just made the story better it made the story better just the process of reducing it down to this mm -hmm. and then i could fill that back out like mm -hmm, once mm -hmm. I made it down, I whittled it down to a skeleton. Yep. Then I could flesh out yeah. the details with like room. Yeah. And, um, and that really felt that's that's. I'm sorry, I'm speaking abstracts. So no, it's no, hard it's, to find the precise examples of that. But yeah, no, it's it's all good. It's all good. Um, uh, so it, this is from Amulet, which is mm -hmm. an imprint of Abrams. Yeah. Abrams was doing. What have you worked with him? I had not worked right, with them okay. before. I uh, actually found them through my agent, okay, um, Scott Zoback, who mm -hmm. uh, uh, I had been pitching it around because I know people at uh, at um, Scholastic, and I, you know, know people at First Second. You mm -hmm. fantastic people at First mm -hmm, Second, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and I still want to work with both of those companies, but mm -hmm. uh, but they passed on the idea because both of them had other witch books. You mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. you know, Scholastic had Witch Boy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and uh and so um they uh, but uh abrams was like we don't have a witch book yet maybe this is our witch book mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and it was really interesting because the process of pitching it and then i had i already script had the script in hand and i sent it out to the to the uh to my editor charlotte and she's like this needs work mm. and i'd never had gotten that before i've never mm. gotten just the like you're going to make this professional, like do, do better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it was, and she, and her notes were just like devastating. And so like, she zeroed in on everything that was missing and every, like she had like a list of notes. And I took like, 
I could take three of them at a time, like this is missing, this is missing, and this is missing. And I like that can be solved with one scene. Mm -hmm. um, originally, I had had the book where one, you know, the, like the meeting of the two characters, you know, uh, Faye, who's the, the, the detective, yep. which character, uh, and the client, whose name is Cody. Mm -hmm. um, and it starts with Cody sitting down at the loser table with Faye. Mm -hmm. And um, and they have this, and they I had this one scene where they were, they sat down together, they connected, and then they bounced off of each other. Right. And Faye, you know, center packing. Mm -hmm. And I, and, and my editor said, no, you need to establish more about who Cody is and what her family is like before right. you build the, whole mystery around her family dysfunction right so i had to write a scene where she goes so and also this scene was just too short and too mm -hmm. too uh you know condensed mm -hmm. to really feel the transformation so i split it into two times at the loser table where cody goes and has this wonderful experience of getting consigned to the loser table because nobody wants to sit with her right and she has to sit with all the losers, right. and then she realizes, oh no, these are this is where I believe, you know, these are mm -hmm. people where that accept me, and like mm -hmm. they don't, I don't have to prove myself. I they just are cool with me mm -hmm. for just being a person. Like what's like, and how that's a good thing. Yeah. And then she goes home, back into the toxic environment of her of her, um, you know, dysfunctional family life, mm -hmm. and she comes back to the loser table with all that toxicity and she tries to make the loser table you know more like her home life right you know like which is like that's kind of the opposite of this. right so and then she bounces off of it and it just works so much better and oh my god like mm -hmm. that experience of having an editor who really mm -hmm. you know is like you can do better than this mm -hmm. and had all the notes and they were good notes and and she um took me to task and made me a better writer. Nice. That was such a great nice. experience. And I love, I love working with Oni Press and the way Oni Press is just like, you just dream up an idea and do yep. it. Yep. We want your pure, yep. unfiltered voice. Sure. Because we're about, you know, telling stories the way, you know, like mm -hmm. you telling stories, you coming up with your ideas straight out of your id and just mm -hmm. on the page. But then this this was a very different experience, and it was just such a neat contrast. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, like what's this is not working. It would be better like this. Yeah, I like that. I like I like the idea of getting constructive notes and and mm -hmm. uh, uh, and and having that. Um, uh, how did so? So you said it, it ended up because they didn't have a witch book. Yeah. Okay. They did not have yeah. a witch book. Yeah. Right. And so and like and and I had pitched originally. I had pitched. Um, this story, the the witch for the a, a witch for hire story, where she was already had a business card mm -hmm. and was going around handing it out to people and whatnot, and uh, and so I pitched that and they liked it, and then I thought, yeah, but that's not the beginning of the story because it doesn't establish enough about who she is and mm -hmm. why she is who mm -hmm. she is. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wrote a prequel story, and I had this idea that I would do like a short story for free comic book day, mm. and pitch and so i wrote this this story as like a short prequel to the main opening issue and then that story grew into a full graphic novel on its own mm -hmm. and and uh and then i pitched that and i'm like what do you think of this like i like this even better nice because it did establish her origins and where she comes from and why she's decided to become this witch for hire and yeah. what it all what it what it means to be uh one uh, you know a caretaker who listens to the people that nobody listens to yeah. but also it's like no i you know i don't do this for free you know you need to like this isn't a gift you know i don't want to do your emotional labor with no compensation mm -hmm. uh that's you know that happens too much sure to people like me sure you know and it, yeah we get we do all this emotional labor and then our reward is basically getting burned at the stake right you know and that's kind of a thing that i wanted to do with with uh with the story and so this really establishes that way more than yeah. than the other one did yeah no i i agree um what's your what's your physical process when you start drawing the comic do you do you write yourself a full script yes okay yeah i start i don't thumbnail it out i write mm -hmm. the outline and then i write the script 
And writing the script gives me this opportunity to think up a, you know, a panel progression, ideas, whatnot, and then throw it away if I want to. Like, mm -hmm. this panel progression just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to rewrite it from scratch. Because writing Faye turns to the left is a lot easier than, like, that takes five seconds. Drawing mm -hmm. is five minutes, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, maybe not five minutes, but, like, drawing, like, it's, you draw, you write it in two seconds, and then right. you draw it, like, sketch it out in a minute and a half. Right. But still, that's more time, and considering where it's going to fit in the panels and whatnot, it becomes more finished, mm -hmm. even in the sketch form, than it would if you just when, it is, when you just write it as a script. Mm -hmm. And because I see them both as the same thing, mm -hmm. you know, S Scott McCloud taught me that that like writing, drawing a face and writing the word face is basically the same thing using different mm -hmm. media, mm -hmm. right? So I'm. I'm drawing it with words is how I think of yeah. writing the script. Um, and, uh, you know, I was having this discussion with Mike Mignola. You know, we were, we were, I were doing, an, doing an interview in France. Um, and uh, they asked, what do I like? You know, what, you know, they were asking us what we like to do better, drawing or writing. And, uh, and Mike did this whole thing. Like, I, I write stories that I wanted to draw. Right. Like, you know, I, and I hit, it hit me as he was describing this. It's like, it's basically the same thing. We want to tell the story with pictures. Yeah. You know, and the story isn't the word balloons. Mm -hmm. That's just, mm -hmm. you know, that's supporting the story in the same way that the pictures support the story. The story is in the marriage, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. and, and so when you write the script, you're really just planning the drawings. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, you're just, you're just drawing them with words and then you draw them with, right. with, with lines. Um, and so I don't really, see, and that being said, there's a visual thing that is, I think that I'm probably not as good at writing sequential art mm. as I would be at just like drawing it out. Like you look at like there, you have some gorgeous Matt Wagner art up mm -hmm. there uh, on the wall and, um, and I'm looking at this art and I'm thinking he didn't tell the story with, he didn't, he didn't script this out. Right. Like it's a scene of a fight. Right. He didn't script it out. He, right sat down and he drew it and yeah. he found the story yeah. as he was drawing it. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think scripting it out first doesn't do that as well. Right. Um, Interesting. But uh, I like the, the freedom to, like I'm really focused on like the structure of the story and the emotional arc of the story yeah. and how, where it leads and all that stuff and finding like, because what I do when I write a story is I, I come up with a present premise and I come up with where I want it to uh, end. Yeah. And then getting there, mm -hmm. bridging the two in an mm -hmm. emotionally resonant way is like the, the real challenge. Right. It's like, because the, the premise of a story asks a question. Yeah. You know, and then the res resolution is the answer to the question. Yeah. But, but, and then getting from one to the other is proving your work, right? Yeah. This is, this proves why this end is the right answer right. to this question. So, that is all the most important part of it. Yeah. And the, the tricks and the beauty of telling a story with images, to me, it's, I mean, it's not that it is secondary, because yeah. some people really make it like that's the magic. Right. But for me, that's kind of, I tend to be more focused on getting to that emotional catharsis of the, the ending mm -hmm. experience in, mm -hmm. a, in, a, in a resonant way, in a way that makes the audience believe it. Mm. Um, how, how involved are your scripts? Are you? Is it very much just page one, panel one, one sentence dialogue? Or I, mean, I put in the necessities. It's not an Alan Moore script. Right. It's not like I'm writing. I'm not writing hundred page scripts for right. twenty four page books. You right. Know? Um, but uh, you know, like I, I try to do more than one word. Mm -hmm. You know, like I don't just. You know, it's not just Courtney. You know, other character. You know, Faye. You know, back to Faye. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like that. I, I want to, the, the script, I try to include the emotion in each panel yeah. somewhere in the description of it. Yeah. You know? And and how much are you thinking about, say, the page turn or the other parts of the language of comics when you're writing that script? You know? What I write, what I do is I write out, um, write out the entire book just, Every, each pair of panel is a paragraph, yeah. right? A sentence to a paragraph. Usually just one sentence, but mm -hmm. oftentimes, you know, more, you know, more detail. So 
and then and I break it up, and then then whatever dialogue goes. Each page, I see. Okay, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then I break it up into pages, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then when I break up into pages, that's when I start thinking about, oh, this is this would be, this is a page turn moment. Mm-hmm. Let's let's I see. end okay. the page here, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then I can go back and rebalance mm-hmm. the panel. You know, maybe this panel should go up mm-hmm. in this page rather than this page. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe I so. Should... In other words, your script is is almost a guideline for you rather than uh, like this is exactly how we're doing it. Well, I mean, when I start scripting, it's just, I'm just describing panels. Yeah. And then I go and split them into pages. I go, okay, this is page one. This is page two. Right. Okay. This is page three. And, um, and then that tells me where the, uh, you know, like where the panels are going to land, where the, the story beats mm-hmm. are going to, like, if you want to, page turn city living oh yeah here we are <laughs> fire truck uh, fire truck go get them boys um and then, but that tells me where i want to um uh do the page turns do the yeah, yeah like have those that impact like, yeah, yeah. this is this is this is the moment where that's a reveal yeah you know or that's a yeah, yeah. that's a story beat that's i want to pause here i mm-hmm. want the character to really i want that surprise mm-hmm. to happen on Mm-hmm. The, not at the be- end of the of this page, but at the beginning of that one. And, and then, you're still you're still doing this as as script. It's all that's yeah. still okay. the script. Okay. And then I go back through and I when I sketch it out mm-hmm. and I see how it reads. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And like sometimes it just doesn't work like that, so yeah. I have to go and resketch. Yeah. And like what I like to do is I like I uh, have a like I'll I'll have a you know I take a, a pad of paper and I turn it on the side and I put the you know I'm left handed yeah. so I put the word the what do you call it the um, the actual board page board yeah pa- yeah the actual page mm-hmm. sketch out here mm-hmm. and then on here i can like redraw and resketch mm-hmm. some of the like no nah, that doesn't like work and let's work out that you know let's let's work out that figure a little more clearly yeah a little more and like this is where the notes go yeah the, the visual sketch notes yeah um and so that kind of makes for a nice uh way of like developing layouts and then you know, it's not a perfect process. Yeah. Uh, it's I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. Yeah. But um, that's kind of how I've been doing it. When you when you do it with a pad, can you do that just anywhere, or do you have to be up at your drawing table? I can do it anywhere, but yeah. uh, you know, the drawing table is nice because I have my computer there. Right. I can like, if I want to reference a figure, yeah. if I want to reference like a car, yeah. I can never remember cars off the top of my head. I need to like, you know, I um, you know, like uh, in in the Courtney books, I have a, a uh, a character who has a um, a little you know 60s Volvo 1850, which is a very uh, stylish little yeah. car. And like at one point, Courtney is like, "I thought you you know I thought you said you drove a Volvo." And she's like, "This is a Volvo." Uh-huh. And it's like, and it's just the sexiest little car you've ever uh-huh. seen. And it's very James Bondy, but uh-huh. in a, but it's a Volvo instead uh-huh. of an Aston Martin, right? You know. And of course, because it's a Courtney Carmen book, it's magical. It's a mag- magical Volvo that springs butter uh, uh, fire um, dragonfly wings. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, I like it, and that's a lot of fun. Yeah, um, and like guns, I can never remember. I can't remember how to draw guns, and right. I, you know, and like it comes up in stories, and I don't guns just they just don't stick in my mind, so I have to reference them every damn time. Yeah, you know, which is a lot of fun. I'm wondering if the FBI is like wondering about me looking up Glock. You know, it's like actually Glock something I, I hadn't hadn't really considered asking someone before, but the whole process of of doing research has completely changed. Oh, it's so much easier. You wouldn't believe, like, what a nightmare it was to have. Oh God, I have to know what this looks like. Yeah, people used to keep files of like stacks you know, of files, stacks of like, of like pictures of cars and pictures of guns and pictures of clothing, and right. just so you could. Oh, oh, it's like that. Okay, right. And like, I remember. The, so I'm on. There's on on Facebook. I'm part of a group called Comic Swipes, uh-huh. and so like you'll see this like Mobius. A uh, piece of Mobius art that I grew up with, and um, you know that I like. Oh, I drew this figure a million. I copied this this figure a million times. Uh, this pose and this figure, and I had no idea that it was actually David Bowie. You know, he had lifted <laughs> it directly from David Bowie on the cover of a magazine. Uh-huh. You know, in this exact pose, uh-huh. and then I turned it into Batman. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, so I somehow I've turned it went from Bowie to Mobius to Batman. Oh, the joy uh, of comics. Yeah, and yeah. like that's comic swipes for you. Yeah. And like, and Mobius's work is full of swipes because he just 
you know, like, you know, what, and I, what I always post on, on comic swipes is good artists borrow great ones steal. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So you've got, uh, you've got a set of thumbnails that you've made at some point yeah. uh, on your sketch pad. And mm -hmm. now it's time to actually take out the Bristol board, right? And actually commit to it. Well, so, what I actually do is I, I, I draw um, the pencils on the drawing pad. Mm -hmm. And what I often do, what I've, what I've started to do off and on is take the sketches and blow them up, you know, I scan them so that I can send them to my editors. Yeah. Um, and then I blow up the scans and then put them on a light box mm. under my mm -hmm. drawing pad and trace mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. so that I have the magic of that. You know, it's, you know, sometimes I've, I'm just recreating the flaws too, yeah. but, but I have the magic of that like electric kind of loose yeah, yeah. sketchiness, the, 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 yeah, yeah. the looseness and the, of the, figures and yeah. and the feel and the feel of emotions and stuff like that and that really kind of lets my my pencils be a lot cleaner and it it reduces the amount of time that it takes to go from sketch to pencil yeah and then i do that again with the inks where i um once i've got a pencil then i tape the uh a bristol board to the pencil mm -hmm. page and then light box that so that i have a so my drawing table is just this big light box yeah and um do you have a, are you doing a lettering step as well or is that that goes digitally i do that okay, all, so all that's, i do that's that it. all with illustrator yeah, yeah okay yeah okay and um and i bought a bunch of fonts from uh blambot yeah you know nate picos yeah uh who just you know like there's like there's all kinds of resources for lettering styles but i really like what he does he'll uh -huh. like i bought a couple of fonts where he has four different versions of each character and it picks one at random hmm. uh, so that that's it, an interesting idea and so like if i have a row of, of hand like because they're supposed to look hand drawn so if there's a row of exclamation points at the end of a sentence like three exclamation points they're all different exclamation points yeah. like slightly different so i have it's nice it's nice you yeah. know bouncy feel yeah uh instead of like the the regimented quality of comic sans yeah you know yeah how um how how long does kind of this each step of this process take you per page would you say roughly um it depends like you know like uh, i just yeah. i have you know i have focus issues so some days i'll like you know it'll be everything i'll take everything i have to like just crank out bare minimum of work and then some days i'll just sit down i'll wake up in the morning make my coffee sit down on a drawing table look up and it's 3 a.m mm -hmm. you know and it's like wow well, that was a good day mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. uh, and it often depends on what i'm what book i'm listening to or what tv show i'm watching i found ted lasso mm -hmm. and like that got me through the last couple of days like oh what a what a nice idea to watch a show where people learn things mm -hmm. and you know get better while i'm working like that just feels so what a ball. how do you how do you <laughs> focus on on paying attention to a television show and paying attention to your work though um you know it's a matter of because uh, the work doesn't absorb me completely mm. drawing doesn't writing i can just sit down in a silent room and just yeah work all day yeah uh, but drawing you says what takes up the the vast majority of man hours yeah. don't tell they don't let anybody tell you everything any different coming up with stories takes time uh -huh. but writing it down ultimately doesn't take a lot of time right it, drawing it that takes just the endless man hours right. endless man hours and you're just sitting there and all your it just doesn't absorb my mind mm -hmm. in the way that writing does um and so if after like an hour of drawing if i'm drawing in silence my brain just starts climbing the walls and the next thing i know i'm like you know, i'm drawing i'm drawing i'm drawing and like you know two hours later i've been on facebook for an hour right right and i have no idea how i got there right um and so that's a bad have it to get into so having the tv show on or the you know book on like a nice terry pratchett book yeah. uh, absorbs my attention uh wow so that i can just uh -huh. quietly get my work done and interesting folk and just be present yeah. for it without you know having without struggling with you know how little it you know it just doesn't take up all all your you know all your brain activity yeah i mean i can see that with some aspects say you know uh inking you know, but is, even is, is, a, is a largely a mechanical process at a certain point, right? You know? 
But penciling is too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it just doesn't take up all my faculties. Hmm. Interesting. Actually, some of the most, the hardest part of my work really is the going and doing signings and in, in France, especially where half, most of the people that I'm signing for don't really speak the language. And uh -huh. so they're just sitting there absorbed with watching me work. Uh -huh. But I'm sitting there going, God, I wish there was music on or I wish there was like somebody to talk to while I'm doing this. Right. You know? <laughs> uh, and that's, you know. Well, sure, because because there you're, I assume that you're kind of drawing the same three or four dra stock drawings again and again and again. You know, it's or at least the same three or four stock characters. Yes, uh, like I try to make it a little bit different each yeah. time. Um, but it's it's all of a piece. Essentially. Yeah, that's yes. all of a piece. It's yeah. all like they want mm -hmm. Courtney or they yeah. want you know like right. Faye. Right. They want Princess Ugg. Right, right, right. You know. Right. Right. And uh, and so yeah, you're you know it's even less absorbing. Yeah. You yeah. know, and it's also harrowing because, like, I have one chance to get it right. Yeah. You know, because it's their book. They already bought it. And now if I do a crappy sketch in it, then, I'm, you know, you're getting a crappy sketch. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so so with your current output, like, what do you consider a, a productive day? Um, well, it's I just I have to be nice to myself and I have to let myself have bad days and good days. Mm. Yeah, you know, and the the productive day. I I don't want to say that I consider it a, an acceptably productive day. Um, I don't I don't want to say that that's the day that I'm work I work eighteen hours that day. You mm -hmm. know, I, you know. Although there are days where I do, where mm -hmm. I just I get up in the morning, morning coffee, work for two hours, mm -hmm. make breakfast, work for two hours. Mm -hmm. You know, make lunch, work for two hours, make dinner. Mm -hmm. You know. After, you know, I like work for eight hours and then make dinner and then like it's that around 10 o'clock in the evening and then go to bed at three. Right. <laughs> you know, right. And like that's like a solid day's work. Yeah, yeah. And those are great days because I get yeah. so much done. Yeah. You know, especially where, you know, pages where there's just a lot of detail. Like I'm doing this in this in the book I'm working on currently is the new um, Cr Crumman Chronicles yeah. series. And like I have this forest, uh, this like forest spirit. Who is loosely based on Swamp Thing, but like all long and lanky and yeah. you know, um, toweringly tall with like yeah. tentacles of you know, like you know, branch tentacles, etc. Yeah. And she's been fun to draw, um, but that takes time. There's a lot of detail there. You know, nothing like what boy back in the my in my day when when young Brian Hedden's handed off like you know, Swamp Thing <laughs> books to young Ted Nafee. Uh -huh. You know the when the, when the, Steve Bissett yeah. and, and and John Toddleman mm -hmm. were doing the Swamp Thing, man, mm -hmm. those were gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Those must have taken ages mm -hmm. to draw. Mm -hmm. I can't even imagine. But I think how they, they just sat there and they did. They this. did though. I, it's, issue after issue. it's interesting. Yeah, I got I mean, I've now I'm friends with Steve Bissett on Facebook. Yeah, which is just yeah, so amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. but yeah, that takes forever to draw. Um, you know some stuff and so like i just you know like some pages take no time at all and some pages take a ton of time and i can't punish myself for taking longer on pages because those pages are those are the reward pages yeah. you know those like you need to have a balance sometimes it takes eight hours to draw one page and mm -hmm. sometimes it takes you know two hours mm -hmm. so for your own um head how are you seeing it in terms of like y your output are you trying to get a book a year done two books a year two that's books my a goal year. Two, two books, books a year, year. okay yeah. two graphic novels right. a year of, of around this 120 or so pages yeah about 120 length. pages yeah, yeah. yeah 120 pages yeah i mean i'm thinking the next Cumberland chronicles book is probably going to be longer uh -huh. i have this idea that's uh don't tell anybody don't tell anybody Shh. but i have this idea for a uh uh, like a scary Poppins kind of situation. Oh, okay. and it was gonna, I was really going to have Courtney become like an au pair. Uh -huh. But then I thought, what if like I have this character that's this ancient fairy woman called uh -huh. the Dreadful Duchess? Uh -huh. And um, and she's sort of like a shadow, like a dark fairy. Um, and I want her to be a, a, she becomes like the governess to these two children. Yeah. And like, and it's sort of, you know, so it's Mary Poppins only. She's this like terrifying, like yeah. ancient fairy woman. And then I thought, wouldn't it be funny? This is the, the scene I'm really most excited about. Like, that, you know, she's, so she's trying to be, what do, what do normal, you know, governesses do with normal children? I have no idea. And, uh -huh. and like the daughter is like, you know, well, you go to the 
you know, we go to the Natural History Museum, we go to the park, you know, we do normal things. Yeah. Stop being weird. <laughs> and so she goes to, the, they, she takes them to the Natural History Museum and she's like looking at this Tyrannosaurus Rex skeleton and she's like, what the hell is this? I've never seen a dragon so huge and terrifying. Look at those teeth. You know, and 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 this, you know, this, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's a, what you already call the professor comes up and says, "Oh, this is a Tyrannosaurus Rex. They existed 65 million years ago." Yeah. And this thousand, you know, like four thousand year old fairy is like 65 million years. And I had the arrogance to call myself immortal. Mm. Excuse me a moment. I need to go sit down. <laughs> <laughs> I like that scene. I like yeah, that scene. like just this idea, like you know, we the fairies think of themselves as this immortals and the brief, you brief, yeah. brief mortal creatures. Yeah, and, you know, I'm four thousand years old. Yeah, and um, and like, no, honey, this is science. Your magical immortality—that's nothing. Yeah. So if you're so if you're doing two books a year, uh, about 120, but that's six months for 120 yeah, pages. Yeah, that's about yeah. That's that's basically a page a day. Yeah, roughly. You yeah, know. Yeah. Taking the weekends off, you know. Yeah, but, taking the weekends off. It doesn't yeah. take that long. You yeah. know, it doesn't. Yeah. You know, for these kinds of books, I'm not yeah. like slaving away. I'm not. I'm not uh, Arthur Adams. Mm. You know, like that dude. Like, I thought his work was detailed back in the, the 80s, mm -hmm. and then he's just like, oh, I'm just going to take all the time I need. Yeah. Like, I don't know how his brain works. Yeah. But he, he must just not care if he ever gets to the end of a drawing, you know, <laughs> because it's just, it's just so precise yeah. and so endlessly yeah. detailed and meticulous. Yeah. And it just only got more it's, so. It's interesting. I, people who can do that always fascinate me because yeah. that's not how my brain works. Yeah. Even I want to get to the bit. end. Yeah. I mean, that's the, the, that's, I mean, but you know, from, to my credit, you know, I've finished more books than he has. Yeah. Yeah, you know, here we are at the end of my career. Not the end of my career, but like deep into not. my career yeah. and deep into his career. Yeah. Um, so I've done more books, but you know, my books are not. You know, I've done less work and more books. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, you know, I, I would say you probably, you know, short of long shot, you probably had more success, you know, than than he has lately. You and know, he doesn't need success. He has suppose, his like. Yeah. He has his like. 5,000 dedicated, sure. wealthy fans. Sure, sure. And he can do like maybe two commissions a, or three commissions a month. Right. And make, you know, probably $15,000. Right. Sure, <laughs> sure. Um, because he can command those kinds of prices and good for him. Yeah. You know, that's what you get when you are a virtuoso. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a virtuoso. I'm not Mike Mignola. I'm not Bill Sienkiewicz. And I'll right. never be those people. And what I've learned is Back, like I was saying, back with the success of Courtney, I had to, you know, acknowledge and really, you know, appreciate with humility the, mm -hmm. the successes that I had. And that, you know, that's, and that those were gifts. Success, yeah. success is a gift. Yeah. It's not something that you're owed by just walking out sure. and doing the stuff, you know, it's, I mean, and I, I appreciate like, and my feed is full of like, you know, struggling artists who are like, get paid, you know, people, you know, people need to acknowledge that art is work. And yeah. I appreciate that. But I also appreciate that, like, nobody needs me to do my stuff. Right. You know, like, I'm not an accountant where it's like needful work that has to get done. Mm -hmm. You know, people need art, but they don't necessarily need my art. Mm -hmm. You know, they, I, I'm, I would, I, I think I would argue against that. Generally speaking, uh, you know, I think that like your, your art has a very distinct style. This is right. very distinctly you. It is very, um, yeah, nobody else does uh, what I do. Nobody I, else does what you do. Right. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I love, for example, your uses of black, you know, it's not, it's not a thing that, you know, it, not, a, not a lot of people do it. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I think, yes, that people do need your art. Mm -hmm. I, I, I I wouldn't have you here talking to you about making art if I didn't think that. Well, sure, you know? but I mean, but I was lucky enough to have found a voice that people resonate. Sure, with, and that's luck. But it's but it's your voice is, right. is what I'm saying. You, you're right. It's luck that it that you found success with it. Right. But it's not luck that it was your voice because it's your voice. And I I don't feel that I was owed that success. Right. No matter how hard I work. Sure. You know, it's not, like I said, it's not sure. being an accountant or a, like a, a, you know, 
or a plumber. Mm -hmm. You know, there isn't the one correct way to do it. And sure. if you do that, you get it, you know, like you get paid. It's no matter how good you are, if people don't want it, mm -hmm. they don't owe you anything. Yeah. You know, and that's kind of the humility that I have. And so it's a gamble. Being an artist is a gamble. Yeah. Every day I'm gambling my life. I'm gambling that I'm going to get to the end of my career and I will have been able to retire on it yeah. or, or, you know, I will be able to support myself through my old age. Yeah. You know, and if I'm not able to do that, I'm, you know, too bad. If I, if Courtney Crumrin kind of fails and I have a number of failures, you know, in a row, eventually people are going to stop publishing me. Right. You know, like if people don't want my work anymore, they're going to stop publishing me and that'll be that. But, but Courtney continues to sell well. Courtney continues to sell well. Yes. So and this seems to be doing okay. Yeah. And, and As long uh, as you're wise about how you manage things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I it seems to me that that's good. And it also seems to me much like a Stan Sakai, right? Right. As time goes on, mm -hmm. 20 years from now, you're going to have more offers to do more things with those properties. Right. Do you with, know? It's with, just it's I'm, how the nature of it works when you stick with something for a long time. It's true. It's true. You know? And, you know, I mean, I, you know, there's interest in Courtney as a mm -hmm. TV property mm -hmm. and hopefully the, you know, that, you know, like, and the, of course, when it goes to TV, it's out of my hand. Sure. You know, like I can, you know, I can maybe negotiate having some influence mm -hmm. over it, but I'm also like, I respect creators. Like sure. they're there. It's an adaptation. It's called an adaptation mm -hmm. for a reason. It's not a recreation. You know, they want to change it. It gets changed. Yep. You know, if they want it. To well, comics are different than, than. I mean, you look at Guillermo del Toro's picture, Hellboy you know? yeah. versus Mike Mignola's sure. Hellboy. These are very different things. Very I mean, so. like Mike Mignola's Hellboy is all about minimalism. Mm -hmm. And then Guillermo del Toro, I remember he, they designed this monster and for, for the first Hellboy film. And they just threw everything but the kitchen sink right. into that monster. And, and like, and Mike is looking at this going, really, really, whatever it is you like about my work, it ain't the minimalism. Right. Right. <laughs> you know. Right. Uh, you know, that because it was Guillermo's Hellboy. Yeah. Like, and, and Mike went and worked on the set. And at some point he realized that, you know, and we all admired Guillermo's work mm -hmm. out the wazoo. Uh, but he, but Mike realized that as, as a person doing work for the Hellboy movie, he wasn't helping Guillermo to create Mike Mignola's Hellboy the movie. Mm -hmm. He was being, um, uh, what do you call it? A, a an art consultant on Guillermo del Toro's Hellboy right. the movie. Sure. So, and that's like the philosophy I would like to approach with it is to, to understand from the beginning that this isn't going to be my Courtney Crumber yeah. on the TV screen. It's mm -hmm. going to be because otherwise I'd get into TV and make, right. make and be a TV writer, which sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> you know, because it's everything sure. that I didn't want. Sure. And everything that drew brought me draw drew me to comics was not having to answer to anybody. Right. You know, and TV is all about answering to people and right. having to prove that your idea works. It right. makes sense. I don't want, that's the last thing in the world I want to do. Yeah. You know, I just want to come up with ideas and do them. And, mm -hmm. and again, you know, like I really loved working on Witch for Hire where, you know, I had this editor who, um, uh, who really used to said, but she wasn't telling me what they wanted. Mm -hmm. She was telling me how best to make my work good. Yeah. You know, she was on the Ted team saying, Ted, you can do better. Right. Not, you know, Abrams wants you to do it this way. Right. You know, like there's two kinds of criticism. There's this should be something, this should be better than it is to serve what it wants to be. Mm -hmm. Or this should be something other than what it is. Right. Because what it is, is not that interesting. Yeah. You know, I'd rather, uh, I'd rather my editor at least be on the, the first type of critic. Sure. Absolutely. You um, would you would hope that all are. You know? Yeah, right. You know, that's uh, the editor's job, isn't yeah. to make it something other than it is, but to just make it something better than yeah. it is. Yeah. Uh, and the critics, you know, uh, once it's done, it's like, well, you know, you, you get to say anything you want about it. Yeah. Yeah. Did you did you color the book yourself as well? I did. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, uh, I, colored, I mean, I'm still working on my color foo. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm noticing that uh, my, you know, like, it, like when I start getting into the dark range, it gets a little muddy mm. and I need to work on that. I, you know, cause the screen, everything is so vivid. Right. On the well, screen. yeah. You, like, you've got to learn the difference between the paper that they're printing it on and right. what it looks like on the screen. I and... was not expecting also, I was not expecting it to be uh matte. Yeah. Uh, I was 
coloring it to be glossy yeah. and then they ended up doing, making it matte because yeah. it's a you know i think because they wanted it to be an earthier darker yeah, look yeah. so i need to brighten up the colors a little yeah. bit further but i think it came out i really like my i i again i had just finished coloring Kermin chronicles which is all purples yeah. and we were talking about this yeah. earlier it's all purples and um and uh blues and yeah. you know somber you know gothy colors yeah uh, and I wanted to just a very different color scheme for Witch for Hire, so I went for Halloween colors, green, yeah. autumnal greens and yeah. oranges. Yeah, no, no, and it's I very, really it's very like nice. it the yeah. way it came out. Like yeah. I love the greenness of this book. Yeah, yeah, I do as well. I do as well. Nice. Uh, so yeah, well, we already know that there's more coming. So I right. like, there's I like that. More coming. I, I, have a, I have plans for. Yeah, I have a deep bench of plans for for Witch for Hire. I, I like that. I, I want to see more. Um, yeah, I, I definitely want to see more. Um, the we don't have any questions or anything, do we? Because you didn't. Okay, just making sure. Um, nothing. Yay! Yeah. Oh, we have, why is Shelby? Why is Shelby so scary? Um. Why is she so scary? I don't. know. I mean, you know, because she's uh, she's the internalized anxiety. I'm sorry. I'm. I'm. I'm I'm explaining the metaphor. You're not supposed to do that, Ted. <laughs> here's what it here's what it symbolizes. Like that's not my job. Yeah. I, it's I don't know. It's not my job to explain that. I have no idea. Why do you think it's scary? Yeah, that's, that's the correct right. answer. She gets in your head. Yeah, that's because she gets yeah. in your head, yeah. and she you know she tells you that. Uh, Caring about people is is going to make you a loser. Yeah, yeah, and it doesn't. That's mm -hmm. the uh, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we'll see. You know, you read the book. We'll see what happens. Um, cool. So uh, I guess that takes us then to the wrap up, which is um, a lot of people watch the series, uh, especially a lot of the kids, because they want to make comics. Right. Um, and a lot of times, you know, people just, they don't know how to start or what to do mm -hmm. or, or anything. Uh, so if you had, you know, a piece of advice or a 10 minute rant, whatever you want, um, and, uh, and it can be anything it can be, you know, sort of emotional or it can be technical or it can be, you know, inspirational, I, you know, we'll just, what would you, what would you have wanted to hear when you were 13 year old Ted? Mm -hmm. uh you know that would help you have have made more and better comics i mean i think the real lesson i learned is you make you get into making comics by making comics you know you actually you sit down you you do the work mm -hmm. make it make the thing you know finish something you know and and i think this is this is another thing is that people love to come up with plans for hundred issue runs, right, or a graphic novel series that's part one of a ten volume, mm -hmm. you know, thing. And for me, like, if you finish a ten page story, it's a better accomplishment than planning a hundred, a hundred thousand page mm -hmm. epic, because mm -hmm. that epic may never get done, and it won't. I promise you, it won't get done. Right, like you, you know. But if you get that ten pages, ten page standalone story done. It's you've done something, you've finished something, and that what an incredible accomplishment! Making it, actually coming up with the idea and making it, putting it on the internet, you know, so that people can read it, and then you get the feedback, and then you get uh, that appreciation loop. Mm -hmm. um, really, the more I do, every, I I go back to my evolution, and the more I just did my own standalone things. Um, like that first five Batman pages that I did and mm -hmm. brought to, you know, mm -hmm. Comic-Con and showed it around to people and people were like, oh, this is nice. You know, you thought up a story and did it. Mm -hmm. um, and the more I did that, uh, the better success I had. The more I created a sample of what I could do instead of just doing something. It's like here's what pages my pages would look like, you know. Here's a plan for an idea for a comic. Mm -hmm. The less, or here's how I, you know, trying to prove that I could do what they wanted me to do mm -hmm. was never as successful as just doing what I wanted. Yeah, to do. 
because when you do what you want to do and you make your thing, uh, you, you know, you, you, that's how your voice comes out. You're putting yourself out there. Yeah. That, I mean, and, and your voice is the most important product because like, I promise you, whatever you can do, somebody out there is going to be able to do it better. Mm -hmm. But what, the one thing that nobody's going to be able to do better is to say what you want to say with your voice. Yeah. That's what I've learned. Yeah. I love that. I think yeah. that's beautiful. I, I, no, I do. I really love that. I really love that. Um, I want to thank you for Witch for Hire. Oh, thank you. Liked it quite a bit. Yay. Um, I, I thought it had a lot to say, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I think you're a fantastic artist, so yay. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I'm glad there's going to be more. Uh, club business. Um, uh, next month's book for the Kids Club, we're doing Rassel Castle here. Uh, Rassel Castle. Don't you love that that name? Um, and uh, and we've got um, uh, Paul Tubin and Colleen Coover who are going to come and talk to us oh, nice. um, uh, on on the internets. And uh, let's see. On Wednesday, for the adults watching this, because I know there's a few of you, we've got Paul Pope. Uh, we're going to talk to Paul Pope uh, about heavy liquid. And then next Sunday morning, uh, we've got uh, Porn Sa I don't even know how you pronounce his last name. Pishishot, I think. I'm going to have to ask him that uh, for the good Asian. Um, and uh, yeah, that should be a good conversation as well. So we've got a great uh, month of stuff. Um, and, and that's great. I would like to thank, uh, I would like to thank you for being here. I would like to thank my staff for running the store and allowing me to have these conversations about comics. I would like to thank Jordan for, uh, for running the show and uh, doing everything to keep everything going. And I want to thank all the members out there uh, for doing this because we wouldn't do this without you, right? And so there you are. If you're sitting at home and you don't know what to do, you, you, you don't know what to read, I think it's a spooky month. It's a spooky book, which for hire is your book here. So you do that. And again, thanks, Ted, for being part of this. Thank you. I really appreciate you inviting me out. Ah, it's my pleasure, my friend. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks very much for watching this episode of the Kids Graphic Novel of the Month Club. If you enjoyed what you were seeing, please uh, subscribe and hit the bell up in the corner. We'd like to invite you to join the club. Every month you'll get a great new book curated by our staff, and it's, it's a fantastic program. So please join. That address is running along the bottom right now. Thanks very much.